This is the Everything 80s Podcast, episode 15, The Memphis Design and the Origin of the 80s Aesthetic. Hey guys, what's happening? Welcome back to the Everything 80s Podcast brought to you by Everything80sPodcast.com. I'm Jamie and this, I don't know, for the average person, this is probably a completely new topic and it's called the Memphis design. And this is what is bringing you that that visual aesthetic and look of the 80s. And if you're, if you're listening on your phone or whatever where you can see the album art or the podcast art, you can see that there in the design of the podcast logo where it's got the you know little squiggly lines and there's the different shapes different geometric shapes and there's different neon colors like pinks and greens and like think about the saved by the bell logo and you can probably you can probably picture what i'm talking about here but this is all it's this whole podcast episode is going to be about how that was created and how this memphis design created the look and the aesthetic of the 80s it's actually a very interesting story so hopefully you like this but before we start if you haven't already subscribe wherever you get your podcasts uh apple podcasts but i think i'm on spotify now uh, google play every, i think everywhere so i should be there okay let's get right into this so this is an episode i highly recommend checking out the what i call the show notes so that's the website version of the whole thing it's got the whole blog but it's got more of the pictures and this one because it's sort of you know talking about a visual topic here if you go to everything 80s podcast.com slash 15 that's got everything there and different images and whatever but we're talking about again like you know when you picture a style or an aesthetic you tend to picture the image hopefully you have in mind again if if you can't for some reason see the my the podcast uh, art or the logo I have just Google Memphis design and you know what I'm talking about. But like I said, the closest thing is picturing like that Saved by the Bell intro with all those weird shapes and colors and stuff moving through it. So the quick summary is the Memphis design was created in 1981 by an Italian design and architecture group called the Memphis Group. They were a collection of artists trying to break away from the modernist design and create more radical designs. And this would end up creating that look of the 80s. And every decade has its kind of own aesthetic. Like you can picture the 70s with its, you know, brown and orange earth tones and hideous shag carpeting and things like that. The 60s kind of, you know, kaleidoscope and flower power look. And then the 80s has its bright, colorful, geometric shape look. And you can... I don't know. Like if you grew up in the 80s, you had this in some form, it, like whether it was on shirts or bedspreads or like a school binder or whatever, or you had posters of Debbie Gibson or Corey Feldman. It probably contained some of these graphics and you no doubt saw them in some form on TV every day. So we'll look at the group that created this and how it became the definitive look. And so like I said the Memphis design was created by the Memphis group which was an italian collective led by a guy named etor sotasis and i hope that's right and it's probably not so they came together in 1981 and they had a they would have a huge influence on the postmodern designs of the decade the group contained members from all around the world and it was made up of designers and architects so they had this memphis group had members from japan the uk australia but they were and more, but they were based in Milan, Italy. So if you're wondering why they were called Memphis, it had nothing to do with being in the U S or Tennessee, but it came from a Bob Dylan song. So one night they're all together and someone put on, if you know, Bob Dylan, the song blonde on blonde, it's one of his songs from 1966. And the song contains the lyrics stuck inside of mobile with the Memphis blues again. And that's just where they got the idea for the name. So, They've been called one of the most influential groups of all time that most people have never heard of when it comes to design and designing and furniture and, and all that sort of thing. And they, and just also the fact that they set the tone and style of an entire decade 
is proof of that. And again, as a bunch of relatively unknown people, unless you're in that like design architect community. So it's important to point out that Memphis would come out of a long tradition of radical design that comes out of Italy in the 1960s. So radical design was actually a movement that happened that was created in reaction to the minimal and very practical aspects that come from modernism, if you're familiar with these different terms. So modern modernism is a little, it's kind of cookie cutter, and it was a little too cookie cutter for artists like who were in the Memphis group. And following modernism was seen as being put into a box, and it had a lot of rules to it. So they liked this idea of radical design. So the designers could now break out of this box and they could play around with more abstract lines. Uh, they didn't have to stay so minimal. Picture Pee-wee's Playhouse when I'm talking about, all, which I'll get to in a bit, but picture Pee-wee's Playhouse and like the actual playhouse and all the crazy stuff in there. That's more radical design. It's abstract lines. It's not minimal, if you hopefully can picture what I'm saying. So the founder of the group was considered the godfather of Italian cool. And the work of the Memphis group was considered very groundbreaking at the time. They incorporated a lot of geometric shapes uh, and shapes that were on top of other shapes. Uh, it was it was abstract, but to the Memphis group, they just wanted to do something that stood out. The I guess the haters of the day would often ridicule their work, saying it had clashing colors, it had weird arrangements. I had too many bright colors that had laminate plastics. Like I said, it's they're like they're designing furniture and rooms and not just art. There was a lot of uh, practical applications of the Memphis design. So now they're, st you know, now they're starting to, un it's been this collective. They're starting to unveil the Memphis design to the world. So in 1981, the group first put their work on display at the Salon de Mobile Milano, which is also my Starbucks order. Sounds like it. So the Salon de Mobile Milano was a design fair and they included all sorts of pieces, including furniture. That was they sort of really getting the Memphis design out there. So each piece, was, again, you de definitely just check out the show notes here. So everything 80s podcast dot com slash one five. Uh, and you can see all these different versions of the furniture and things they created. So each one, each piece was named after a hotel such as Sheraton or Bel Air. And this Memphis group was creating a kind of what they called faux chic. And they are taking cheap materials and then putting them over crappy like fabrics and other materials, but then giving them high end names. It was almost like not that they're dumpster diving, but they're taking like almost like refurbishing other pieces. But then they make them sound better by calling it like Plaza Vanity or Bel Air or whatever. Just, it, it, I don't know, it's kind of like a juxtaposition of two different things, like high quality, but from low quality. So the impact on the show was that some people loved it and it confused the living crap out of the others, but ultimately people were talking about it. So there was a very high excitement in the air in 1981 at this show. And then the hype grows more and more so that the, exhibition was getting swarmed if you can believe that or not one of the memphis group members riding to the exhibition in a cab thought there had been a terrorist attack because of all the people congregating together turns out it was just the lineups and the swarms and the masses coming to see some of this unique new art it, it was making that much of a hit in milan so now it's about spreading this memphis design around the world. And one of the big ways that this is done is because of MTV. So first off that, you know, the Memphis group, it's a hit at this exhibition in Milan and it's, it's now it's cemented them as inspirational artists and designers. So the, the work, the Memphis design is now starting to show up in magazines. Uh, and then the aesthetic is just now going to blow up and it co coincides right with the start of MTV in 1981. So if you're a kid listening to this out there, MTV was a thing called music television, which is what old people used to watch music videos on. And what's a music video? So that's basically a three minute movie where people in long hair and spandex play guitars that have sparks showering out of the guitars. Like 
or there's guys in white Adidas shoes kicking down walls. So if you can remember or picture or want to look up, you just have to look at the original logos for MTV and their video packages, and you can see the Memphis design in action. There's lots of colors, there's shapes, there's scratchy graphics. It's all influenced by that movement that's coming out of Italy. So at the time, you know, MTV is basically flying by the seat of their pants. The idea of playing music videos on TV was actually seen as pretty ridiculous, which seems weird to look back on, but it would become one of the most iconic stations of all time, and it changed the way that we consumed music. Bands that never you know, considered how to present themselves either had to learn this new format or be left behind. So as everything grew with MTV, so did the aesthetic, and that would help cement the Memphis design as the design of the 80s. So it's still going along and it's, um, again, MTV's just pushed this new um, idea and design and color and color scheme and everything on everybody. But not everyone is watching MTV. It's, a, you know, some younger people, but it's starting, the Memphis design starting to show up in different ad campaigns. It's in different movies. Um, again, the constant exposure on MTV is helping and it's becoming more commonplace. So then a huge movement for Memphis design that cemented it as the eighties aesthetic, especially for people my age or younger people in that generation came out in 1986. And that was Pee Wee's Playhouse. So like in case you don't know, created by Paul Rubens, Pee Wee Herman was a man child who lived in a very abstract world. So he makes his big screen debut in 1985 in Tim Burton's Pee Wee's Big Adventure. And then he moved to Saturday mornings in 1986 with Pee Wee's Playhouse. So the show itself and the movies had a campy sort of kitschy style to it. And the TV show combined some 1950s style along with this new Memphis style that was springing up everywhere. So again, you can probably have these images or these images from Pee Wee's Playhouse are probably still burned in your memory as it was basically like the Memphis design threw up all over your screen. Like every different aspect of the Memphis design is in Pee Wee's Playhouse somehow. So again, Pee Wee's Playhouse wasn't the only thing that embraced Memphis style, but it really helped to accentuate it there. And then there's a lot of others, but here's a few more notable uses of the Memphis design. And like I said, say by the bell, from 1989, specifically the Say by the Bell theme intro. And, you know, we all know Say by the Bell, the story of Bayside High, the perfect high school in California. And that color scheme throughout the show made very, um, made a very good use of this Memphis design and made everyone familiar with it, even though they didn't necessarily know it was a specific design. The intro of Say by the Bell combined everything you might've seen at that original Salon de Mobile Milano exhibition from 81. You've got the clashing colors. You've got mix match geometric shapes. You had swirls, other weird shapes all combined together. And it incorporates some of that scratchy graphic look uh, in the intro, the same way MTV had used it back in 1981. So to me, the intro Saved by the Bell was trying to embrace this MTV culture and it was using something familiar that kids and younger people knew was geared towards them. So MTV was not for parents or whatever, but as soon as you saw that Memphis style, it was kind of like this code to a kid to know that this was right in their wheelhouse. And I think Saved by the Bell is the kind of vehicle or platform that brought the Memphis style to more of this iconic status because future generations would end up watching it along with, you know, kids of the eighties, they'll forever recognize that unique style to that time period. And I just think that was with the creators of say by the bell, they, they took what MTV had used to show like, Hey, this is actually cool. This is for kids. When you see this color scheme and this design style, um, you know, we have you in mind and it's not for older people or parents or whatever. But like I said, people who, you know, MTV changes over the decades and the years and they change their, their, their look and their intros and whatever, and they get away from the eighties aesthetic and that Memphis design. 
but a show like Saved by the Bell is going to be watched by every generation onwards, so it'll always kind of live on. Another big example of this use of the Memphis design, Back to the Future 2. And obviously another iconic movie comes out in the late 80s and made sure to embrace all things Memphis style. It was, you know, most notable in the cafe 80s in 2015 when they go ahead to the future. So even though the movie was made during that time period, they were aware, like, you know, is it made in the 80s during this time of this aesthetic. They were very aware to make a novelty restaurant in the future completely embrace this Memphis style. And that whole cafe 80 scene is a perfect snapshot of the Memphis style and the Memphis design. And like, I'm just looking at some of the pictures now and you can picture it. It's, you know, it's got the black and white sort of checkerboard floor. The seats are these weird abstract shape designs that are like turquoise on them. Um, through the wall, there's these like odd sort of like half moon shaped things. The booths have these triangle attachments. Again, you can picture it. If not, just look it up or go to the show notes for today. Okay. So let's just look at this whole legacy of the Memphis design. And so the Memphis group themselves had started to disband around 1987 due to the recession of that year, spending money on art dropped big time. And so did the potential for income. The Memphis group always had a big focus on furniture design. That was like their kind of bread and butter, but it never really actually caught on as far as like personal sales and and things like that. It was so extremely abstract and it just, it wouldn't find a place in most houses that again, we're going for, you know, that fake wood wall paneling and orange shag carpet still. If you think every decade, the average household is using design and what was popular basically like the decade before, because not very many people could always update and have what was current and fresh and new. So that's why like 80s houses, like say like my basement had that orange shag carpet and fake wood wall paneling that was pop- popular in the 70s because it was carrying over and people just, you know, aren't renovating their whole houses. So every decade is like a little bit behind. So the legacy they did leave was in the design it just that dominated so many areas through the 80s and into the 90s like this was just didn't stop in 1989 it kept going so from a design influence standpoint the the influence so many and it still made its way into things like i don't know if you've ever seen the very first apple watch from 1995 before obviously the future apple watch they brought out their own watch and it's completely got that memphis design to it the, the different color coordinations, the weird angular shapes. Again, look this up and you can, I've got an image of it on the show notes today. So Memphis design would also show up, you know, again, in fashion shows and pieces. Um, and the furniture was still embraced and coveted by famous, more eccentric people like David Bowie or Carl Lagerfeld. Lagerfeld. The, you know, and the style would pop up every now and then. And, you know, it's been 40 years, but you see it making a comeback of sorts like fat, you know, fashion and style tends to always come back around. So you might again, see it at different points. So either way, the Memphis design was the design that represented the eighties. And like, I'm, you know, basically just summing up, you could ask anyone on the street that probably doesn't know the name of this thing, but they could almost certainly identify it and know what it means. And almost like, look at it fondly and in a sense of nostalgia because it was the visual aesthetic and it still got a place, you know, in their mind and they remember it from all these things they loved or shows they watched. So it it made an impact without really being known. And I just, I think it's a pretty interesting story of this whole thing. Okay. So that's it. I'll wrap it up here again. If you haven't already, make sure you subscribe wherever you get your podcast. I should be there. If you're listening on YouTube, there'll be a a link down below to the show notes. Again, everything80spodcast.com slash 15. So you can see everything. If you're on YouTube, you can subscribe there while you're at it. Do whatever you like. I'm okay with it. Okay. Thanks for listening. I'll see you soon. 88 miles per hour!